previously on the Storm Mythology series. After returning to Xavier's mansion, Sunfire, Jean, Bobby, Warren, Alex, and Lorna decide to quit the X-Men. Throughout their final night together, Angel attacks Wolverine, concerned that he was about to attack Jean Grey. The two men engage in a fight until Storm separates the combatants with a bolt of lightning. As Jean comforts a surprisingly dejected Wolverine, Storm notes her gentleness and kindness and comes to admire Jean Grey even more. The next morning, Jean and the others depart, leaving Cyclops as the last original X-Man on the new team. But just before she leaves, Jean promises Storm that the two women will stay in contact. Once back inside, Cyclops wastes no time introducing Storm and the new recruits to the school's combat training facility, the Danger Room. Storm and the X-Men train for three months straight, five days a week, six hours a day, not allowing the African tribal goddess any time to truly adjust to human life in America. As the moon sets, so does the sun rise on a new day. And after starting their morning with yet another rigorous, uninterrupted six hour training session in the danger room, Storm, as always, is enjoying her favorite hobby. Fly. By midday, the day has been more like summer than autumn, with a strange, sultry heat that even dusk has not dispelled. And though Aurora Munro is immune to any variations in climate and temperature, it is a relief to plunge into the pool. Aurora loves to swim, almost as much as she enjoys flying. Usually, she swims alone in the cove just below the mansion, preferring the natural water of the inlet over the chlorinated pool water. Over the past three months of them being together, her teammates have come to realize that Aurora is a solitary woman. She enjoys being alone. So when Nightcrawler spots her in the pool, he is pleasantly surprised to see that she has finally joined them. But then... Nightcrawler instantly teleports out of the water and back to the pool side, intercepting others. He orders them to return to the pool house immediately. Kurt, is something the matter? Aurora asks. He tells Aurora that it is nothing and he continues to herd the men back inside. But just as they are about to turn away, Aurora ascends from the water in all her glory. Nightcrawler! She shouts. Why are you behaving like such a loon? There is no response, for Aurora has rendered the men speechless. Why are you all staring so? She asks. Piotr can tell that Aurora is unaware of what she has done. And he takes off his shirt and gives it to Aurora, who is quickly becoming one of his closest friends on the team. As he removes his shirt, Piotr tells Aurora that he thinks that it would be best if she puts it on. Aurora, confused, puts on the shirt, which hangs as a gown on her still dripping wet, 
five foot eleven frame. If you insist, Peter, but I admit I do not understand. Aurora relents, frustrated. Well, maybe customary in Roadland, Aurora. Xavier says telepathically. It is not in this one. For the sake of group harmony, I suggest that in the future you use more modesty when you appear in public. As you wish, Professor. Aurora still does not understand. She never wears clothes while swimming in the cove. Alone. Furthermore, in Africa, where she is worshipped as a goddess, Aurora has been nude since she was a young teenager. And as a goddess, she had no need for human things like clothing, especially since she is immune to the temperatures of the elements. I must have seemed like such a crazy girl to you all back then, she says. <laughs> How was I to know that what is considered a virtue in Yuzuri is considered indiscreet in this country? Moreover, back then, I honestly had forgotten the effect nakedness had on others outside of my village. Thankfully, I had you to show me the ways of American culture. You helped me understand. The next time I saw you was in your new apartment in New York City. We had kept in contact as you promised. And you invited me to your new apartment, your first home outside of Xavier's walls. <laughs> you were so proud. I remember thinking as I flew over the city that once you had told me that nearly 8 million souls called New York home, I could not understand how they could endure steel and glass and concrete towers that they considered homes. Where do they find the proper air to breathe, and sun, and sky, and bittering green? How do they sustain their inner beings? These people must be mad, I thought. But then, what did that make me? After all, I had willingly chosen to join them. Excited, Jean Grey greets Aurora from her terrace as she approaches. Welcome to my humble abode, Jean says. Welcome to my first apartment! Jean proudly gives Storm a tour of her new home. She tells Storm that it used to be the studio of a famous artist, which is why the place is so expensive. But don't worry. She tells Storm, I got a roommate. You'd love her. <laughs> She's a private investigator with the coolest name. <laughs> Gosh, listen to me, I'm babbling away. It's so weird. I'm actually really nervous right now. In truth, no less than I. More than once, I very nearly turned back. Jean says that she is glad that Storm did not. There are so many guys in the X-Men. She tells Storm. We guys have to stick together. But I thought you left the X-Men. Storm says, confused. In some ways. Jean replies. You never leave. Abruptly, Jean remembers that her roommate might be home at any moment. She says that her roommate does not know that she is a mutant or that she was an X-Men. And she asks Storm to change out of her battle uniform, as she does not want to reveal either of their secret identities to her. As you wish. There is a flash of lightning, and then... Aurora! Jean yelps in shock, spilling her coffee. From Jean's reaction, Aurora understands that she did something unusual, yet again. Is anything the matter, Jean? Aurora asks. Kurt and the others behaved the same way this morning at the pool. Well, don't you believe in clothes? 
Jean asks. Here, take my robe while I find you something to wear. Believe in clothes? She scoffs. My powers naturally protect me. I am never too cold or too hot. And I have lived this way amongst my tribe in Africa since I was 16. Jean, who is also an empath, senses from Aurora's thoughts that she genuinely is not bothered by exposing herself like this. Okay, but what about modesty? In this land, Aurora snaps. Must I be so ashamed of my body that I should hide it? American customs were beginning to frustrate Aurora. Jean tells her that it is not about being ashamed of your body. She tells her that walking around in America, or anywhere for that matter, could land her in a world of trouble. She hands Aurora one of her own dresses. I fear no man, Aurora says as she puts on the dress. And I... Aurora pauses as she shimmies and shifts to pull the dress down. I am not comfortable. Being in Jean's small apartment was already making Aurora agitated. But now in this tight-fit clothing, for the first time in America, Aurora is starting to feel the onset of another claustrophobic attack. Luckily, Aurora is distracted by the sudden entrance of Jean's roommate, Misty Knight. Instantly excited to see a tall, deep brown-skinned woman with snow-white hair and sky-blue eyes, Misty quickly introduces herself. Sorry, Misty, but we have to get going. Aurora here is having, um, a fashion emergency. She looks good to me. Aurora, we gotta go. Gotta go, Misty. Bye. Jean says, playfully pulling Storm along by the arm. <laughs> it was good to meet you, child. Storm says to Misty as they rush to the door. Farewell, Misty Knight. She shouts after the door closes. Bye. Misty yells back. Love your accent! Hours later, the two women have joyfully made their way uptown, talking and laughing all along the way. Aurora and Jean even stop for ice cream, which Aurora discovers she loves. Her bags are filled with long, regal, flowing garments, courtesy of their unlimited access to Xavier's billion dollar fortune. While they shopped, Aurora and Jean have revealed many things about themselves to the other. At the moment, Aurora is revealing to Jean just how in tune with the planet and its ecosystem she is. I can hear every shift in the wind. I can feel the restless alchemy of the hydrologic cycle. For example, after it rains, I can feel when the drops begin to evaporate into gas. And I feel it as that gas joins again with the air currents. And I feel it when those air currents are rising 10 to 100 feet, rising into the clouds. And I feel it as the crowds become heavy and wet, filled with gaseous light. To me, the dense, moisture-filled clouds feels like a migraine, or like most times, a heavy weight upon my shoulders. We, my friend, the sky and I, tense, both of us, waiting for the moment the moisture drops from the sky again as rain or snow or hail, and start the cycle anew. Aurora says that she has had to learn to steal her mind and to selectively filter out most of the stimuli. 
This world is full of distractions for me as well, you see. She said, sir. There never is not weather, little one. So there are times when I need the peace and quiet of solitude to soothe my inner being, to calm and ease the raging tempest that ever resides within all men. So you see, I too have had to work hard to make peace with my gifts. But your powers are so wonderful. Jean tells Ororo. I would love to feel included in the weather, to be one with the planet itself. But honestly, Jean laments. Sometimes my powers feel useless. Don't tell Scott. But I know the other original X-Men have always considered me the weakest. I can't tell you how many times the boys have had to rescue me. And yet you fight on, Jean Grey. Storm comforts. Uh, In the midst of immeasurable odds, you still champion Xavier's dream for mutant human coexistence. And that, the strength of your spirit, is what makes you stronger than them. After all, where I am from, the lioness are far more dangerous than the pampas males. She winks at Jean. I make no mistake. Though I may seem confident, like you, I battle my own demons. The street is as crowded as the Ethiopian marketplace as Ororo grew up near. Ororo and Jean are relaxed, caught up in their conversation. Of God. So, neither senses the skateboarder's approach until it's too late. He attacks them from behind, grabs Jean's purse, and hurries away. Watch the bags, Aurora. Jean sneers as she recovers. I'll nail the little creep. At first, there are too many thoughts in the crowd to get a fix on him. But soon, Jean sees him descending into a subway tunnel, and she follows. Meanwhile, Aurora has gathered all their belongings uh, and she rushes the back of her friend. But then seeing that the stairs lead down, under the ground, and into pitch black darkness, Aurora hesitates. Jean went down these steps. Aurora thinks to herself. Under the ground, it is so dark that I actually feel cold. The stone walls seem to shift and move as if they are alive, as if they are hungry, as if they are waiting to devour my soul. Meanwhile downstairs, Jean grabs the thief. Luckily for him, a train arrives and dozens of passengers rush out. Jean is momentarily overwhelmed by the multitude of thoughts and emotions. She struggles to filter through them to find more. In the meantime, the kid is gone. Reluctant to leave, Jean relents and angry at herself for letting her guard down. She returns to the street where she finds Aurora still standing. What the heck happened, Aurora? I needed you. I... Forgive me, Jean. Aurora, please. I do not understand. Do not know why I... I, I could not move. The closer Jean gets to Aurora, the stronger the images in Aurora's mind become. And without warning, telepathically, Jean unintentionally experiences every moment, every feeling of every one of Aurora's memories. No wonder, Jean says. I can see your memories clear as day. You were buried alive as a child, weren't you? Your mother died right beside you. Oh, Aurora, 
I didn't know. I'm so sorry. How dare you pry into my thoughts, mind witch? How dare you? Thunder roars. Feeling the privacy of her mind was violated, Aurora lashes out with a hurricane and takes to the air. The weather in the city now matches her fury. And in that instant, Jean finds herself blown more than a mile away into the sky. She focuses her telekinesis to hold her in place, and she levitates herself there in the sky. As she approaches the gathering storm clouds, Jean can see that Aurora has already transformed into her battle uniform. Aurora, please! Jean shouts. Stop this before someone gets hurt! Someone already has been Jean Grey! Storm cries. By trusting you as a friend! Thunder roars. This is merely fair payment for that betrayal! She shouts. In an instant, Storm flies close to Jean. Speaking directly to the face. I am a goddess, Jean Grey. Do not become so familiar with me. My thoughts, my past, my secrets are my own. You have no right to pry. I didn't mean to. Jean appeals. Jean apologizes and explains that sometimes the images and emotions are too strong, and she can't help but read the minds of the around her. You're my friend, Aurora. Jean tells the storm. Whether you believe it or not, you've become like a sister to me. I would never betray you purposely. You have to believe me. Hearing Jean call her sister causes a storm to pause. She searches Jean Grey's arms, peering into her soul. She uses her own spiritual empathic abilities to feel Jean's emotions. And Storm realizes the deep sincerity of Jean's apology. Spirits of earth and air! Storm prays. What have I done? Jean, I apologize. A silence command from the goddess of the storm banishes the tempest as quickly as she summoned it, and a gentler breeze returns the two women to the now deserted city streets near their packages. Our packages all. I dropped them all. All those beautiful fashions ruined. Jean quickly reassures her that most of the garments can be salvaged. And if not? She says jokingly. We'll just go shopping again, courtesy of the professor. They laugh quietly. <laughs> Listen, Aurora. Jean says. We all live with demons. Trust me. I'm a telepath. I know this better than anyone. But the question is... Do we rule our demons, or do our demons rule us? I confess. Storm sighs. I am afraid. America is the land of my father, yet the culture here is so alien, so strange. Such strange lands, strange people, strange customs. I want so badly to run back to my village in Kenya, to a life that is familiar, where I am respected and worshipped as a goddess and the traditions and customs make sense and no one knows of my soul weakness. The darkness of this subterranean way, like the future is unknown and terrifying. I do know is that once one starts running, they may never stop. I agree. And you don't have to run ever again. You can beat this fear if you want. We both can. Aurora, I've got your back and you've got mine. 
the first ladies of the X-Men. We're the X-Women. They laugh out loud <laughs> together. And don't worry. Jean continues. This never happened. Your secret is safe with me. I promise. Storm smiles. Somberly. Jean, do you really think of me as a sister? I think we are closer than my own sister and I. Yes, Storm, I do. Then, my sister... Storm says... Let us face this fear of mine. Together? I took your hands and we entered the subway together with a secret of our own. And from that moment on, we were bonded together, no longer as just friends, but as sisters. Hey, yeah.